All right. If you look at a graph of n versus z for all the stable nuclei, what you'll find out is that all the stable nuclei that exist fall in a very narrow region on this graph. So, and we call that narrow region where they all lie on this n to z the belt of stability. So at up to atomic number 20 or so, the slope here is perfect 1. Because up to atomic number 20, what do you want your n over z ratio to be? 1 to 1. But then it starts drifting upward to a slight excess of neutrons once you get higher than atomic number 20. Cool. So that's your belt of stability. It goes back to that n over z ratio. These are the stable ones. So, and if you get outside this region, so by any significant degree, say you're out here, or out here, or maybe you're way up here for a heavy nucleus or something. So you're probably radioactive, and you're going to undergo a nuclear reaction in an attempt to get closer to this belt of stability. So we'll see some examples of that. So the spontaneous routes of nuclear decay. So the first one is alpha decay. So an alpha decay is also called alpha emission. And whenever you hear the word emission, that means a particle is being emitted. It's a product in a nuclear reaction. So we already saw an example of an alpha decay just a little bit ago. So and on the product side was indeed an alpha particle. Cool. So the rest of the reaction is whatever it is, but you have to have an alpha particle as a product for it to be an alpha emission. Cool. If you actually we'll come back to this in a little bit. So the second type, so will be beta decay, but technically there's three different types of beta decays, so we've got to be a little bit careful. So the first beta decay they ever knew about was just simply beta emission, electron emission. And because that was the first one they ever knew about, they just simply referred to beta decay as that. Subsequently, they found two nuclear reactions later on that also involved beta particles of some sort. One was a positron. So, and so if we talk about beta decays, we usually just refer to this one. The other two are types of beta decay, but we usually give them special names and talk about positron emission and electron capture to specify. If we just say beta decay, we're talking about electron emission. And so in this case, being electron emission, emission means it's a product being emitted, so, and you'll have to have a beta particle or electron, same diff, on the other side. So then you got positron emission, and again, being emitted. Where do I expect to see a positron? On the product side. Skip that one for just a minute. So we'll talk about gamma decay. Gamma decay is also called gamma emission. And being emission again, guess where you're going to find the gamma particle, or the gamma ray, I should say. Product side. So this one's going to have a gamma on the product side. The only one that's not the emission is the one you guys in particular don't have to know, the electron capture. But being that it's captured, that is the one case where the electron again, which could be written as beta, is a reactant rather than a product. Cool. If we talk about what these things ultimately accomplish. So if you notice, which, which of these is the only one that would actually affect the mass number in a, re, in a particular reaction? Which is the only one that actually would affect the mass number? Alpha. So in this case, it's the only one that's got a mass number. So your product nucleus, sometimes called the daughter nucleus, would be a lower mass number than your reactant nucleus, the parent nucleus. So, but for the rest of them, it's not going to change. The rest of these aren't going to change the mass number at all. And so alpha particle, ultimately, what does it accomplish? It reduces the mass. It reduces the mass. And specifically, reduces the mass number, as we'll see. Now, for the next three, it's often convenient to think about 
a neutron in one, uh, in one light here. So if you look, if I had a proton in this hand, or if this hand represented a proton, what would its charge be? Plus one, and what would its, what would its mass number be? One, so one, one. If I had an electron in this hand, what would its charge be? Negative one, what would its mass number be? Zero. If I combine them into one giant particle, what would its charge be? Zero. What would its mass number be? One. What has a charge of zero and a mass number of one? A neutron. And so you can think of a proton and an electron as coming together and forming a neutron. So let's look at this here for a second. So let's look at electron capture first. I know you guys didn't know that one, but just to demonstrate a point here. Electron capture is when one of the inner core electrons is sucked into the nucleus. And when it's sucked into the nucleus, that inner core electron combines with one of the protons in the nucleus, turning it into what? A neutron. And so the net result here is that this converts a proton into a neutron. OK, let's look at beta decay, electron emission on the other side of the story. In this case, you've got a neutron in the nucleus, and that neutron ejects an electron out of the nucleus. Gone. That electron's emitted. What's left in the nucleus then? A proton's left behind. And so in this case, it converts a neutron into a proton. The exact opposite. So then it turns positron emission, ultimately turns a proton into a neutron as well. So we don't normally deal with positrons, a positively charged electron in any normal sense, but it is part of nuclear chemistry. They can be emitted out of the nucleus. And you'll have a proton, and effectively, we're just emitting and getting rid of the positiveness of that proton, if you will. So we're not getting rid of any mass, or at least no mass number anyways. A little bit of mass, but no mass number. But we are getting rid of a plus one charge, and so your proton is there by converted into a neutron as well. So positron emission and electron capture both convert a proton into a neutron whereas beta decay converts a neutron into a proton. So, and then gamma decay, like one of you guys pointed out, so doesn't change the mass number or the atomic number of the nucleus at all. It's again just excited state down to some sort of relaxed state. So the next thing we'll talk about is why would any element want to do one of these things? Why would any element want to do one of these things? So well, which elements would like to lower their mass numbers? Because they're all radioactive. Z greater than 83. If your atomic number is greater than 83, you're probably going to want to do some alpha decay. Lower your mass number down. So, but the next three, we're going to talk about in the context of the belt of stability. So for beta decay, electron emission here, why would you want to turn a neutron into a proton? Well. The, the answer to any of these questions is to get more stable, but we want a little bit more concrete answer there. Why would you turn a neutron into a proton? Well, if you have too many neutrons and not enough protons. Where would you be on this graph if you had too many neutrons and not enough protons? Above the belt of stability. So if you're up here, if you're this, like this guy right here, so you're going to want to do beta decay or beta emission. Because ultimately, that will lower your n over z ratio to getting closer to being on this belt of stability. Whereas on the other side of things here, so why would you ever turn a proton into a neutron by positron emission or electron capture? Well, if you have too many protons and not enough neutrons. If your n over z ratio is too low. And so that's where those other two occur. Question. Would they ever ask us to like calculate the ratio? Like would they give us like number of protons, number of neutrons, and say what's your ratio where you They could do something along those lines. More likely the question you'll get would be something like this. Let's say I gave you this guy, and I said, what is the most likely route of nuclear decay for him? Well, should I expect him to do alpha emission? Where's that? Where's fluorine? So fluorine's atomic number nine. It's right next to neon. 
and, uh, and the oxygen on the other side. Well, it's super electronegative, but that's, that's again dealing with properties of the electrons, not properties of the nucleus. So in this case, is he a heavy metal, atomic number 83 or, high, or 84 or higher? No. So probably wouldn't at least initially suspect alpha emission, but it's all based on the n over z ratio. How many neutrons does he have? 11, and how many protons? Nine. What n over z ratio does he want? One to one. one, to one. Where on the belt of stability is he? He's up here. He's got too many neutrons and not enough protons. He's above the belt. So based on what we just talked about, what should he want to do anyways? He should want to do beta decay because that converts what into what? Neutron into a proton. So if we look here, if we have him do beta decay, that means a beta emission. So beta particles, a product, what are you going to be left with? What will this mystery particle be? Atomic number is? And mass number is? 20. So, and that happens to be neon for atomic number 10. And now what is the n over z ratio? Ten over ten. Is he happy now? Yeah. So by converting one of his neutrons into a proton, he now has an n over z ratio of exactly one. He's totally happy by doing this. So that's the other kind of question you could get: is just what's the most likely route of radioactive decay for him? If he's above the belt, the n over z ratio is greater than one, beta decay. If it's less than one, positron emission or electron capture. Take your pick. All right. Two types of nuclear reactions that can be used for purposes of releasing mad amounts of energy. So fission and fusion, which one do we do on planet Earth in our nuclear reactors? Fission. So if you think of the word fission, fission, so is the splitting apart. It's when you take a large nucleus and break it up into smaller nuclei. So whereas fusion, what is the word, what do you typically associate with the word fusion? Bringing things together, fusing them together. And fusion is when you take lighter nuclei and put them together. Okay. So what do we typically use? Think of some elements you might think of, you know, being involved at nuclear reactors. When you think of radioactive stuff, what do you think of? Uranium. What's that? Uranium. 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 What else? Plutonium. Come on, guys. You've watched enough sci-fi sci movies, Cold War movies. So uranium, plutonium, heavy elements. And if we're using heavy elements, then again, which one of these are we doing? Probably at nuclear reactors heavy elements, we break them apart. It's the light elements that we actually fuse together. And the idea is this, the most stable nucleus that exists is iron 56. The most stable nucleus that exists is iron 56. If you're heavier than iron 56, then let's split you apart to get you closer to 56. If you're lighter than 56, then let's fuse you together to get you closer to 56. So again, attempt to get more stable. So fission, we can do at room temperature. So we do these in our nuclear reactors, your nuclear bombs. Fusion, on the other hand, fusion is only possible if the temperature is high enough, i.e. millions of degrees. Guess which one we don't do in our reactors? <laughs> so this guy, because millions of degrees. If you guys recall the, you know, actually you guys probably aren't old enough to recall the big cold fusion hoax back in, I think the late 80s. So somebody said, I can do fusion at low temperatures. It's amazing, it will revolutionize the world, and it would revolutionize the world. You know what the most common element to use for fusion is? Hydrogen. And where do we have tons and tons of hydrogen that we could uh, tap into? The oceans, the lakes, water. So it would have been amazing, because the fuel would have been like, you know, something you get from water. And it would have been great, but it was a lie. So it takes millions of degrees to get there. Where do you find fusion happening then, where millions of degrees are possible? Yeah, the center of the star, you know, center of the sun, so to speak. That's where it happens. So where else can you get fusion happening? Atomic bomb. So your nuclear bombs use fission, but your atomic bombs, your H bombs, use hydrogen, and hence, they're actually fusion bombs. But here's the problem. To get your atomic bomb to go off, the temperature has to reach what before it actually detonates? Millions of degrees. So how do you get the area around the bomb to reach millions of degrees so the bomb will go off? Well, you attach a nuclear bomb to 
to your atomic bomb, the nuclear bomb goes off first. It's the detonator. And because huge amounts of energy get released, that causes the atomic bomb to go off, which has an even bigger payload. So if a nuclear bomb is your detonator, you're a pretty big freaking bomb, right? 